I'm Roger Sherman. I am a member of the advisory board at Hamptons DocFest, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. And I want to thank both of you for making this film. Thank you. Um, did you have any, first of all, how long did it take you to make it? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a story, obviously, that I've been Living, with. living for a long time, and I uh, well, the actual making of this film went pretty quickly because HBO came on board early, and those as documentary filmmaker, you know that when you get a budget right away, you can really move and not have to stop, stop and start a lot by stopping to raise money. So that was a huge gift to be able to just focus um, on it um, without raising money. So I'd say it probably took uh, about two years. And from the beginning. When to, did you get the idea, or where did the idea come from? Well, I, you know, for years I've thought, uh, why hasn't anyone made a film about Roy Cohn? Because I, I, I really thought that when he was a fascinating figure, I, of course, knew the connection to uh, my family, but I knew a lot more after um, visiting the AIDS quilt, as you see in the film. So I always thought, you know, he was, he was riveting and, and fascinating, just as Tony Kushner. Realize in, right, in Angels in America, and but I just didn't want to revisit. I knew that the way into the story would also be revisiting my my family history, which I had done. You know, I had made a film in 2004 called Air to an Execution. It's what got me into documentary filmmaking in the first place. And I thought, let somebody else do a film about Roy Cohn, but it didn't happen. And then. The morning after Donald Trump was elected, where I was, you know, completely, you know, out of my mind with uh, fear and rage and all the other emotions that, that many of us had, um, I said, "I got now. I got to do." I said, "This is what I'm going to do. This is going to how I'm going to channel it. My, you know, upset. I'm going to. This is what I can contribute potentially to understanding how we got here." And so I, so I said that morning, I actually said, "I'm going to go. I'm going to do it now." And but it wasn't until I found Peter Manso, who you meet in the film, who had the tapes, that I really felt I had something um, in addition to my, my family story. You know, I mean, that wasn't going to be enough. I knew I, I wanted some real material. I wanted to hear Cohn's voice. I wanted him narrating his own story in a way. So that's what, that's what, really, that's what, um, that's what I took to HBO. And I was able to sell the film um, on that, and and feel comfortable and feel confident that I had something, you know, to contribute. So, but then there's another Roy Cohn film that came out that came out right around the same time, so I wasn't alone in feeling that this the timing was right. Yeah, I, I want to come back to Peter Manso, but I sure. wanted to ask you, you've been fighting Roy Cohn your entire life. It really was amazing. I mean that that exchange Ivy and I had when we talked about the AIDS quilt, that really was the case. I mean, he became the spokesperson for the government from 1974 till he died. I mean, that, that thing where we're both before Congress, we're, we're sitting next to each other and he testifies and then I testify. And then there's that debate and there was another debate that we didn't get film on. Uh, so I, was, I debated him twice and sat next to him before the Congress and he was always there. He was, he was the man. And you, I, I guess you spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to not just get him, but how to clear your parents' name. Well, it, and we, it was initially did, did, a very did having your daughter ever make a film come to you? Oh, I know, we'll make a film. <laughs> well, um, Ivy made the first film, Air to an Execution, where she explored the case in her own way. This thing with Roy Cohn was actually more a story about a, as Manso says, an extraordinarily complicated man. He's not just the horrible, evil person. He's also very complicated, bully, coward, victim. He's all three of those things. But, and I also, as I, when I would pitch this or talk about it, I would say he began his career prosecuting my grandparents, and then went on to do so many other things that, that need to be explored and talked about. And nobody had really dug into his life in Provincetown, or, you know, I mean, I hadn't really seen that, and people didn't really know that. So I, I wanted to show that, you know, in, in a sense, I mean, try to understand where he, where some of, how he became a monster, really. 
and and in a lot and to me he became a monster in large part because he was uh, closeted and self-hating he hid he had from himself he lied and and he was never able to be be who he really wanted to be you see how much more you see the difference in his face in the photos you know when he's in Provincetown or or even when he's um, with G David Shine when he's younger and he's and he's just but he was a tormented soul, and so he and he's a victim of bigotry, you know, the bigotry that he, you know... That, that he fomented. Yes. <laughs> and that he visited on so many people. I mean, that section where uh, the McCarthy committee is going after quote-unquote perverts, the Lavender Scare, which is rooting gay people out of government, fired more people than the effort to get subversives out of government which is for a fact that I didn't learn till after Ivy made the film. Yeah. So, um, M Manso, is that his name? Peter Manso, yes. Peter, um, when did he come to you? What's the chronology? Well, so I, I knew that Cohn had spent time in Provincetown, because um, I, I have spent time there myself over, for many years since I was a kid. And so I, I kind of, I knew about it. I um, There's a book, uh, Nicholas Von Hoffman's book, Citizen Cohn, which is, probably the best biography of, of Cohn talks about his life, the time he spent in Provincetown. So I immediately started digging around there and I, I had a friend who um, is gay and a big part of the gay community there and I said, I said, Adam, you gotta help me find, help me find someone, you know, someone who's been living in Provincetown a long time who might have come across Cohn and that's just how, you know, you try to begin, you know, to find these paths. So he connected me with this gentleman um, who had never heard of Roy Cohn, which was very surprising, but had a lot of great stories about life in Provincetown, but then ha happened to be staying with this guy, Peter Manso. So I had coffee with this gentleman, and then nothing came of it, and I thought, you know, this is just the beginning, this is what, you know, you meet all these people. Did he know he who called, you were? Yeah, he knew who I was, <laughs> and then he called me the next morning, he said, I'm staying with this guy, Peter Manson. When I told him that I had met with you, he practically spit his coffee out at the <laughs> breakfast and said, get her over here right now, I have to meet her. And so it, that's how that connection happened. It turned out that Manso is a, a you know, longtime journalist and he, ha in his basement, had these, the tapes. Um, and, and I thought, well, this is, you know, this is the beginning of, and of course, you know, I mean, I, I looked for tapes everywhere. I mean, I, and I got close, so, I have numerous examples of people saying, I have tapes, and then they couldn't find them, and, um, and then Lois Romano came late in the game, um, when I discovered her, I read a couple of articles where she had, um, some articles from the Washington Post, uh, about Cohn, and I thought, well, and she said, oh, I'd never save anything. I never save my tape, so I did a great in, that great interview with her, and then she went home and she dug around in her things, and she found the tapes and she found her reporter's actual reporter's notebook with the notes from interviewing Trump, and she makes that essential connection between Cohn and Trump that I feel is like really tells us the moment when Trump really started to think that he could be. <laughs> I know it's really chilling, and 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 then and then obviously you know next stop Moscow when he you know right, when he course. says oh his next stop's going to be Moscow and, right. and now we all know what what that means. Um, so. I'm going to break a rule of doing a Q and A right sure. now and ask a question that has nothing to do necessarily with your filmmaking process. Do you have any idea how Manso got all those bank records? He went through Cohn's trash. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, you know, he became friends with, with Roy. I mean, I didn't even, I have all this material where I thought, oh, should I explore this strange, you know, how even P Peter Manso became enamored with him and started hanging out with him. I mean, this is what Cohn would do. I mean, he, he became... Norman Mailer. Well, he, yeah, well, there's a whole story about he and Norman Mailer, too. But um, Manso... You know, he, but then they had a falling out because when, it's a long story, but Norman Mailer, Roy Cohn, and Peter Manso owned a house together. It's mentioned very briefly in the film, but they owned a house together in Provincetown. And Cohn had the cottage on the property. It was a, it was a complex. It was a big house. And Manso and Mailer, Manso was writing a biography of Norman Mailer. They had a falling out that, that turned into a fist fight that, you know, they never spoke again. And Cohn took Mailer's side and never spoke to Manso again. And I think after that, Manso 
went through his garbage and got his <laughs> just happened to go through his garbage every night for a year manso manso it's not it's it's not a it's not we make him look pretty good in the film let's yeah. just put it that way yeah. um, <laughs> he's another <laughs> Contrary to what you all may think who are not filmmakers here, um, while it might look like this film just got put together perfectly, um, one scene to a next, to a next, to a next, <laughs> films are made in the editing room. And you can make a good film, but you never know if it's going to be a great film. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk about your editing process? Because it really just, I mean, you had this incredible wonderful chronology that you could follow. On the one hand, that's the easy part, mm -hmm. but your film would have been 12 hours long. And then you found these wonderful subjects, these wonderful characters. Tell us about your editing process. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, you're absolutely right. It is, it's where it all comes together. I mean, you can, you can collect all amazing interviews, have all this archival footage, and still, it feel, at times, it feels like a mess. And you're just you know, watching cuts, and you're like, this isn't working, it's boring, it's this, it's that. We really, uh, I would say, I mean, we were editing while we were shooting the entire time. I mean, that's, I've never done that before. And that, that was a challenge, but I've we- I've never we, done that either. We wanted, to, we wanted to move quickly, so that was part of it. And that, but that created its own challenges because we were kind of, it, it became, it was piecemeal at first. But, um, so we, you know, we were editing for a year and a half. It's an, it's an incredible- Who's the editor? Um, Ann Alverge and, uh, and Adam Kernitz. So I had, and then I also had an, a wonderful assistant editor who, you know, you never stop until you lock the picture. I mean, I don't know, I mean, I, that's how I am. I mean, I'm just like, this is not quite working, it's not perfect yet, it's not. So um, we, had, we had run out of enough money to keep editor on full time, and we were down to an assistant editor who turned out to be Julie Gaynan is her name, and I, she got her first additional editing credit on this film, and she deserves it so much, because she and I sat together and redid whole sections and moved things around. I just, I didn't want it to be chronological. I, I wanted, and I wanted it to be anchored by the really strong anecdotes, you know, the really, those stories like, um, like the Congressman John Leboutier yeah. or, or, you know, um, Cindy Adams. And I, and I, you know, I wanted the, our, all of the subjects to feel like characters too. Um, and, and then there was the weaving of the family story, and that was, that was probably the most challenging. I mean, I had, I had a lot of, we had a lot of debates about, um, there, were, there were some people on our team who really thought we should end the film with my dad walking up to, um, walking up to Sing Sing, and that, it was power, you know, it, could, it felt powerful at times when we were watching that, but then I kept saying, this is not, this really isn't about my dad, it really isn't about us, it has to be, come back to Roy. So that was kind of an operating principle, like always let's get back to Cone. Same thing with the Trump storyline. If it became too much about Trump, I would say we gotta get back to Cone. I mean, Trump, Trump is part of his story. That, that's really smart. You know, the, I have a saying in my editing room, you gotta keep your eye on the prize. And if it gets too much off onto somebody else, who may even be more interesting than your character, which yes. is impossible in this in this situation, <laughs> you've got to. It's called killing your darlings. It is, and, and it's just, very true. You can go do, like I was just talking about this whole Norman Mail, this trifecta of of uh, Manso Cone and Mailer. I was fascinated by that story, and I had this whole long section. Then eventually, I was like, you know what? That's really getting a little too far away from. Well, there's from another what we, film. Yeah, and so. Your uncle, my uncle Robbie, didn't want to be in it. You didn't. No, feel? I just, I didn't. I mean, he, I didn't need him in, in a way. Sorry, Robbie. <laughs> Is he I still didn't. talking to you? Yeah, he's still yeah, talking yeah. to you. <laughs> but I mean, you see him in the footage from when uh, they're younger, um, in the '70s, when they were together yes. all the time, actively <laughs> pursuing, you know, the reopening of the case. So. I just didn't feel, I didn't feel like, I Well, mean, the other part of it is that I was the one who debated Cone twice, and I was the one who was uh, sitting next to him at Congress. But other than that, I mean, the, you know, when Ivy's footage from when she was a kid, Robbie was in there, even though I'm the one talking, and then in the 70s, we're both together. We're like joined at the hip in all that it was, politics. Yeah, it, but while that makes yeah, sense, yeah. 
especially in a family movie, it would have been very easy for you to say, well, I really have to put my uncle in there because he's going to be upset and I really have to do that. And you often see films where you go, why is this person there? Yeah. I don't know that we would have said that, but it sounded well, like you, a very smart... you might have because there wasn't really... A, you has to be a real reason. I mean, my father is... is is representing the story of what happened to them. Yeah. And you don't need to hear it twice, you know? I mean, you don't need to hear it from another perspective. And also, my dad is the older son. He has the, uh, the more vivid memories, yeah. and, and he's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we do want to let you all go home tonight gonna, sometime, so. but perhaps there's a question or two from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Did I, somebody say no, if you didn't yeah. hear that, of the interview subjects? Yes, quite a few people. Actually, I'll give you the two, the two that I worked the hardest to get and, and, and didn't end up. Um, uh, Peter Fraser. The boyfriend um, who still live, he lives in New Zealand, and I communicated with him numerous times, and I, I felt that I got very close with him until he asked me for a million dollars. And I said, "Do you realize I make documentaries?" <laughs> so. <laughs> well, you could have done a Roy Cohn and promised it I to mean, him. I mean, it was it was it was kind of nuts. I mean, I you know. So then um, the other one was a woman named Susan Bell, who was Cohn's secretary for 30 years, and I was I mean, I real I just wanted to t talk to her so badly, and she and I had gr it was a great phone conversation. So I thought I was getting really close with her. She wasn't well, so I, you know, I, I'm, I didn't want to push too much. And then at a certain point, she just said, "I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk to you anymore," and kind of hung up on me. And I, yeah. So, um, yeah, the quite quite a few, but uh, I do feel good about who we got. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's do two more questions up there. Uh, apropos of that, what about uh, Barbara Walters? Yeah, we did try, you know, Barbara Walters is, is not doing well. She hasn't been seen in public in a few years, actually. She's, from what I understand, she's very, she's very ill and possibly has dementia. And I don't want to say anything that I, isn't true necessarily. But we got very close because I have uh, friends who work in the news business who, who know her and really tried to get her. But they just said it's just not happening. And I said, well... Could we just record her as audio? And you know, I was always trying to find a way around it. We don't have to film her, um, but no, same. Yes, you know, she she couldn't do it. I guess One maybe more. didn't maybe didn't want to either. Somebody's got a really good anything for my question. Opinion. Go ahead. <laughs> the Um, well, this will be on HBO eventually. There we're we're talking about a spring release on HBO. And you know, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I, I'm kind of, um, yeah, I'm exp I, I wanted, I had something I, I wanted to do on Capitol Hill, a follow up. I, I made a show called The Hill, um, called The Hill, uh, uh, that was on Sundance Channel years ago where I went inside a congressional office and filmed a uh, congressman and his staff. And I thought it would be great to be, do that again now, but it's very hard to get the access. Are you doing so a theatrical release? Uh, yeah, well, HBO will probably have it in theaters briefly, because maybe to qualify yeah. for awards. Um, but I don't, you know, I think the the other doc. There's another Roy Cohn film that I mentioned called Where's My Roy Cohn. Not to give them too much <laughs> um, attention, but they he that film has been in theaters, so I think it may make it difficult yeah. for us. Yeah. For us, there's maybe only so much appetite in theaters for Roy Cohn, but. Um, yeah, it'll it'll it, we are doing festivals um, and and then it'll be on HBO. So we'll we'll, we'll be in theaters briefly. Great. Thank but. you so much. Thank you both of you. Thank you all so much for being.